It's my pleasure to welcome Chris Kotke of Northeastern University, who will speak to us today on transgression to loop space and fusion. Great. Thanks, Dave. I'm pleased uh, for the opportunity to speak here. So what I'm going to talk about is joint work with Richard Melrose. And then here's a, a preprint on the archive if you want to read it. It's a short paper, 10-page paper. There's no analysis in it. This is all just Czech cohomology. It's a nice little result. Um, so the motivation for this problem, so it actually sort of goes back to an old problem that I'll, I'll describe of trying to reconstruct a line bundle given its holonomy function on, as a function on the loop space. Um, but then was more recently motivated uh, in the string geometry program of Stoltz and Teichner in, in classifying so-called um, spin structures on loop space, which are related to string structures on the manifold. And I won't talk about that at all. I'm just going to talk about the sort of um, interesting problem that it, that it motivates. Is that Stefan Stoltz? Uh, yes, at Notre Dame. Dame. Yeah, that's right. He was new when I was there. Um, but to, to state sort of the older problem, if I have, okay, so M is always going to be just a, a compact Compact finite dimensional smooth manifold. Um, and so if I've given, if I'm given a complex, let's say, Hermitian line bundle, complex line bundle. Um, uh, so if I equip E with a connection, so let me say a Hermitian connection, then then I have the notion of a holonomy around loops. So let's call this the holonomy associated to E in the connection. So if I have a smooth loop in my manifold, I can you know, pick a point in the fiber above the starting point of my loop, parallel translate around the fiber, and I get back um, to the fiber where I started, but not the same place I started. And that difference um, is going to be uh, given by some, some point in U1. So this gives us a map from the smooth loop space. So just smooth maps from the circle into M to U1, the structure group of my bundle. And so this you know, sort of U1 valued function on LM has nice properties. And you can ask the question, if I just give you this function on LM, can you sort of recover the, the line bundle on M? And also, can you sort of characterize which functions, which U1 valued functions on the loop space are holonomies of, of line bundles? Um, and to put this in a uh, somewhat broader context, uh, let me point out that holonomy implements transgression. So what is transgression? Transgression is just a map in cohomology from so the cohomology of the space to the cohomology of the loop space. And it's fairly easy to understand. So if I start out with, I'm just going to take, let's say, cohomology with integer coefficients on M. Well, there's a nice evaluation map from, from the circle times the loop space. There's a nice evaluation map. If I have a point on the circle and then I have a loop on M, I just evaluate the loop at that point on the circle, I get a point in M. So I can pull back by this evaluation map. That gives me a map from cohomology of M to cohomology of this product. And then you know, cohomology of the product of a circle in a space is just sort of two copies of the cohomology of the space, um, you know, one copy having a degree shift. So then I can. So I can pull out that degree shifted part by, you could either say, sort of integrating over S1, or if you like this better, capping with the fundamental class of S1. And this is going to spit out an k minus 1 class on the loop space. And then, so this composed map is the transgression homomorphism. So in general, T is neither injective nor surjective. In general. Um, if you like it better, there's another description of the transgression in terms of the spectral sequence of the path vibration over M. It's the sort of connecting homomorphisms that go from the you know, 
the bottom part of the spectral sequence, the line down here to the top part up here. Um, and so for each degree, at some point in the spectral sequence, there's a homomorphism like that. But this is maybe a, a simpler geometric description. Um, OK, so I have this nice map in cohomology. On the other hand, elements in, or these cohomology groups also classify some geometric objects on my space. So let me just use the notation x to mean sort of either m or the loop space. Then, so using the fact that cohomology with integer coefficients is isomorphic to cohomology of x, well, sheaf cohomology of x, um, no, this should be minus 1, uh, sheaf cohomology of x with values in the sheaf of continuous u1 valued functions, then you can see that um, these cohomology groups classify certain objects. So for instance, h1 of m, sorry, of x, well this classifies sort of u1 valued functions up to homotopy. On x, right, and that's what kind of object we get from the holonomy of a line bundle. On the loop space, we have a u1 valued function, um, and then it's sort of easy to see that it's if I have um, isomorphic line bundles, I'm going to have homotopic uh, holonomy functions. H2 classifies line bundles, or I could say principal u1 bundles. up to isomorphism. And then what about H3? So H3 sort of almost by definition classifies gerbs. I mean gerbs are these geometric objects that are cooked up in such a way as to be the things which are classified by H3. I could say U1 gerbs. And there's different sort of flavors of gerbs that you could talk about. Maybe you're, you know, the nicest geometric version is, is the theory of bundle gerbs due to Murray. And then up to some notion of equivalence. If I'm using bundle gerbs, I need to, I need to take what's called weak equivalence. And then it's true that U1 bundle gerbs up to weak equivalence are classified by H3. And then you can kind of keep going. Well, so as I get higher and higher cohomology groups, I get sort of higher gerbs. Word gerbs, that's a good question. Is that a word in some language? I think it's a, yes, it's a word in French, or it's at least derived from some word in French, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, right, so then this sort of motivates the geometric question of which of these geometric objects on the loop space um, come from the image by some kind of transgression of geometric objects on M. So, let's say arise from a transgression from objects on M. Um, so in the case k equals 2, this is essentially this problem that I mentioned over here. So you know which u1 valued functions on the loop space are holonomies of line bundles, and can I can I go back and forth if I'm given such a such a function? How do I know it's a holonomy? And if I do know it's a holonomy, how do I sort of reconstruct the bundle up to equivalence? So this goes back to work of um, Telemann in like 63, and then Barrett uh, 91, and then sort of further uh, elucidated by Catano Picken, I think 93, um, to sort of state one of these results uh, in broad terms essentially says that, let's say, bundles, so 
let me try to introduce some notation here as I say this. So let's say this means bundles on M up to equivalence, so the set of bundle, U1 bundles on M up to equivalence um, is in bijection with the set of uh, So U1 valued maps um, from LM, which are invariant, on, so this means invariance under thin homotopy. Which I won't give you a completely proper definition for because I don't want to, I'm not going to end up using it much later. But essentially what it means is I'm allowed to do homotopy on loops except I can't sort of move the loops very much. So if this is a given loop, what I'm allowed to do is I'm allowed to stay within the image of the loop. So um, instead of going straight around, I can sort of move along the loop. I can move back, and then I can go forward and back. I can also sort of branch off the loop. I can kind of go off the reservation a little bit, as long as I come back along the same path. So I have to do sort of a homotopy within rank one maps, essentially. So it's a, it's a fairly restricted notion of homotopy. And if I have a function that's... Um, it's invariant under thin homotopy. It turns out that it's, well, and I should say, some kind of sufficient smoothness condition. So sufficiently smooth thin homotopy invariant maps are holonomies, and you can reconstruct uh, the line bundle and its connection. Um, in the case k equals 3, so now we're asking the question of which line bundles on, or which U1, principal U1 bundles, if you like, on the loop space arise from kind of some kind of transgression from gerbs on the manifold itself. And so here it was Conrad Waldorf in, I think, 2010, who identified the key property of fusion. Okay, so what is fusion? So actually the concept of fusion for functions goes back to Stoltz and Teichner. And then for bundles, the definition of fusion is due to Waldorf. But it's actually, it's sort of simple to describe. So if I have three paths that have the same endpoints, so these are so these are supposed to be three paths on my manifold, just based paths. So gamma i and say smooth path, smooth maps from the interval onto M, no choice of base points or anything, which have the same endpoints. Then I can join them up, join them up into loops in various ways. So if I define the loop Lij to be the path gamma i join, so this star is going to mean join, to the path gamma j bar, where bar means reverse, right? then I can see a bunch of different loops in here. So L12 is first I go along gamma 1, and then I go backwards along gamma 2. L23 is first I go along gamma 2, then backwards along gamma 3, and so forth. Um, there is a, a technical point here, which is that if I just have smooth paths with the same endpoints and I join them up in this way, I don't necessarily get a smooth loop. So there's some technical issues that you have to deal with if you want to be in the category of smooth loops that I'm mostly going to ignore, because at a certain point later, I'm just going to pass to continuous things and ignore all these. But you, know, it's a, you can deal with these technical issues. So if I have such a configuration, then I'm going to say that this loop L13 is the fusion product of the loops L12 and L23. So it's kind of a product operation on loops, except I can't take the product of arbitrary loops. They need to be sort of specially configured so that the second half of the first loop is the first half of the second loop in reverse. And then if I have such a configuration, I can um, Make a third loop by sort of excising the middle bit, if you like. Um, OK, and then I say a function 
is fusion. So let me say a function. Let's just say u1 valued function, but it doesn't matter. It could be a real valued function or something else. Um, is fusion if its value on L13 is the product. So if it's sort of multiplicative under this product map. So if f of L13 is equal to the product of FL12 and FL23. So notice that holonomy has this property. Right? So if, I, if I'm taking holonomy of some uh, line bundle over M, and so I you know, start at some point in the fiber over this base point, then what is holonomy? As I said, we do parallel transport along the loop, and I get to some point in the same fiber, but a different point. And then I look at the, um, the group element in U1 that maps my initial point to my end point. Well, so if I start in here and I do parallel, if I do parallel transport, along gamma 1 and then backwards along gamma 2. And then I follow that with parallel transport along gamma 2 in the forward direction and then backwards along gamma 3. Well, that's the same as parallel transport just along gamma 1 and then gamma 3 because I went forwards and backwards along gamma 2. So holonomy is, is a fusion function. So what does it mean for bundles? Let's say a bundle. Yeah, well, I mean, well, what's confusing is that what's confusing is that there are a lot of different kind of products on loop space, and depending on what other structures you're looking at, like if you're allowed to reparameterize loops or do homotopy of loops, then you can turn a lot of these product structures into the other kind of product structures. Um, and so, you know, in the, if you're looking at just thin homotopy, then fusion is sort of sort of already there somehow. Um, so a bundle, let's say a U1 bundle, is fusion if there exist isomorphisms from the fiber at L12 tensor the fiber over L23 to the fiber over L13 for every fusion triple of loops. And then when I have a configuration of four things, then there's an associativity condition. So let me just say with associativity. Uh, well, I'll just leave it at that with associativity. Because let me, there's sort of a, a more global way to restate this. So. So if I denote by I am the free path space on M, so let's say smooth maps from the interval into M, well, this is a fiber bundle over M squared, over two copies of M. So that's just you know the initial points and then the end point of the path, just evaluation at the initial and end points. Well, then I can look at the fiber products of this fiber bundle. Uh, with itself. So I'm going to use this notation. So I, t I with two in brackets is going to be the fiber product of this thing with itself over as a fiber bundle over m squared. Um, so again, that's a fiber bundle over m squared. And this just, repre you know, this just represents configurations of two paths that have the same endpoints. That's all it is. So I can do a similar thing with you know, higher and higher products. So I can look at I can look at I3 um, of M, which are exactly these configurations. So configurations of three paths that have the same endpoints. And then this comes equipped with three maps to I2, where I just forget one of the paths. So I'll call those pi IJ, where IJ remembers the ith and jth path. And then I can say fusion. So F is fusion, for instance, a function. If um, oh, right, and I should have said this, you know, configurations of two paths with the same, with the same endpoints, I can identify this with the loop space just by joining up the first path with the reverse of the second path, modulo technical issues about smoothness. So then I can say that F is fusion if 
as a function from the loop space, if I pull it back in these three different ways, then the product, the alternating product, vanishes. So if pi, uh, let's see, how's this going to go? Let's see, pi 1, 2, well, I can just say it this way. If pi 1, 2, star f times pi 2, 3, star f is equal to pi 1, 3, star f as a function on I3m. And I can make a similar definition for bundles, right? So a bundle is fusion if when I pull it back from the loop space identified with I2m to I3m, then there are isomorphisms between the tensor product of these two things with the third thing, which satisfy an associativity condition when pulled back over I4 that I won't state. All right, so that's the property of fusion. And it was Waldorf who defined it for bundles and noticed that that was one of the key properties to characterize objects which are in the image of the transgression map. So Waldorf, there are one or two Fs in Waldorf. Um, so in 2010, showed that there's a, actually equivalence of categories, but let me just say bijection of sets, but a stronger result, um, between say, gerbs, so U1 gerbs, on M up to a suitable notion of equivalence with, uh, how shall I say this? Well, okay. Instead of defining a thing, so let me just say bundles so which are one, um, fusion, and two, have an equivariance with respect to thin homotopy. So. so not quite invariant. Um, well, it doesn't make sense to say that a bundle is invariant under thin homotopy, but sort of equivariant with respect to thin homotopy. Um, and then just recently, last year, Melrose and myself Uh, gave sort of a different version of this. So the same thing, bundles on LM, which are fusion. It turns out you can replace uh, the thin homotopy equivariance with sort of two properties. So an equivariance just with respect to oriented diffeomorphisms of S1, so just acting by reparametrizing the loops along with a, like a very strong smoothness condition. So let me just say strong smoothness. Which is very nice um, for the purposes of doing analysis on these objects over loop space. But I'm not going to talk about this um, result in detail because it turns out that this and Waldorf's uh, result for gerbs, these are all sort of harder and harder to push to higher and higher degrees. So as you go to sort of higher gerbs, there are these you know, more and more associativity conditions that are built into the definition of higher gerbs, and um, they become sort of a real pain to deal with. Um, and so, but motivated this quest, by this question, we thought, well, let's take a step back and just try to, you know, maybe instead of dealing with um, these objects in their full geometric realization, Maybe we can just do this at a sort of intermediate level, at the level of check cohomology, right? So check cohomology is typically how you prove that these geometric objects are classified by cohomology. So for instance, if you have a bundle, how do you look at it in terms of check cohomology? So given a good cover, I can trivialize it over the covers. And then the data that sort of constructs the bundle is over the, the overlaps in the cover, the twofold overlaps in the cover. Um, I have maps to my structure group that sort of glue the the trivial, the locally trivialized bundles together in a globally non-trivial way. And so those maps from the one-fold overlaps give me a check uh, zero, zero cycle. Um, one cycle? Oh man, I'm going to be confused. They give me a check co-cycle, and then you can, you can check that um, 
if you choose a different, you know, if you, if you modify that up to a boundary, you get a, an, uh, an isomorphic bundle and so forth. And sort of the same thing is true for gerbs. They have a nice sort of, you can build them out of check data. So can we do this for check? And in so doing, we're sort of looking for, you know, these are nice conditions, but they're actually quite, quite strong conditions. So is, you know, is, can you sort of identify what are kind of the weakest conditions um, on, the, on the loop space so that you can characterize things which are in the image of transgression? So that's the result that I want to talk about for the rest of the time. So in order to state that, I need to introduce a second product on the loop space. So again, I'm just going to draw some pictures here first. So now I want to suppose that I have a configuration of four paths that are arranged like this. So gamma 1 and gamma 2 have the same endpoints. Um, and then the endpoints uh, of gamma 1 and gamma 2 coincide with the initial points of gamma 1 prime and gamma 2 prime, and those have the same initial and endpoints. Um, so this is sort of a figure eight condition, if you like. So I'm going to define three loops here. So I want to see the first loop is this small loop in the bottom. The second loop is this small loop at the top. So the beginning of the second loop is halfway through the first loop. And then the third loop is going to be the large loop where I do the whole figure eight. Gamma 3 is going to be gamma 1 joined with gamma 1 prime and then joined with gamma 2 joined gamma 2 prime all reversed. So this is loop 1 is this, loop 2 is this, and loop 3 is the whole thing. Maybe I should put gamma 1 prime and gamma 2 prime, I should reverse them, and then the loop 2 is actually really the, the figure 8, but however you draw a figure 8. So then we say that L3 is the figure eight product of L1 and L2. And again, I can give a similarly global version of this as I did over here for fusion. All right, I can look at the space of these kind of configurations. I'll call that L8M, the space of figure eight configurations on M. So this comes with three maps to loops where, again, given a, Sorry. go ahead, yeah. So you had gamma one, gamma two, gamma one prime, gamma two prime, and yes. you call this the, the figure eight product of just, oh, of L1, idiot. Yeah. L1, go ahead. So L1 and L2 are composable if, yeah. right, L2 starts midway through L1, and then I compose them in that way. Right, so I can look at the, sort of, all of the configurations of this form that comes with three maps to loops where, the first map is I just sort of forget the top piece. I only take the bottom loop. The second map is I take the top loop. And the third map is I take, so I'll take P1 and P2 are going to be the sort of projections onto the small loop factors. And then J, I'll call J the sort of joining of these two things. That's the, the product. So then, so for instance, uh, a function, let's say, is figure of eight, you know, if P1 star F, P2 star F equals J star F on, when I pull it back to L8M. Okay, so I have this fusion product and I have this figure of eight product. And so now what I'm gonna do is define a refinement of check cohomology on the loop space in such a way that transgression factors through this refinement as an isomorphism. So to talk about check cohomology, I'm going to need to say just a few words about covers. So first, I'm going to cover M. M is just a compact manifold. Um, 
So I'm going to cover this by, so um, given a point on the manifold, little m is going to be all points m prime, such that the, well, okay, so I'll put a, G, put a, a metric, a Riemannian metric on my compact manifold. Um, and then let me let epsilon be less than the injectivity radius of this metric on m. So then given a point in m, I can look at all points which are within, the, within epsilon, so in particular smaller than the injectivity radius of m. Um, and I'm going to index this, why not, just using all points of m. So just a huge cover, but it doesn't matter. And you can, if you like, you can work with a finite cover here, but it's just more convenient to work with the whole thing. Um, as I said, I'm also going to just use the continuous version of the loop space. So now I'm redefining the loop space to be just continuous maps from a circle into M. Um, redefining my path space to be continuous maps of the path into M. And then, so I have associated, so I claim this is a good cover. So since I took geodesic balls, you know, any n-fold intersection of these things is contractible. So it's a good cover. Um, Right, and then I'm going to have good covers of my path and loop spaces. So let's say, for instance, cover LM by, so I'll say gamma L is an open set given a, a loop consisting of loops L prime such that right, so such that this the supremum as I go around the loop of the geodesic distance between L and L prime is within my injectivity radius. So this is also a good cover. And, you know, indexed by all, all loops, why not? Again, I can, I can pass to a, a finite cover here, and then I can get a countable cover here by only looking at loops that, by taking as my base loops, ones that sort of pass through a finite number of points in a certain order. But it's just easier to take all loops, and it still works. Um, and similarly, I am. I have a similar covering of path space just by taking all paths and then looking at nearby paths. So these are good covers. And so if I take check cohomology with respect to any of these covers, I get the ordinary cohomology um, of, of the given space. So let me just say cohomology of check cochains of any one of these things, in particular. I'll take coefficients in Z, but I could take coefficients in an arbitrary abelian group. It doesn't matter. All right, so if you know, check cohomology, there's a way of turning, um, so let's say, you know, Z-valued uh, functions, local Z-valued functions on open sets, there's a way of defining a, a complex on that. And then the cohomology of this complex, since these are good covers, is the ordinary cohomology say of loop space, but also true of, well, okay, so I'll use my notation x here. So for m, for lm, whatever, I compute ordinary cohomology. So now I said I want a refinement of check cohomology. So I'm going to do this in two steps. I'm going to define two successive subcomplexes of the check cochains. So there's a subset of ordinary check cochains on the loop space. I want to define the fusion cochains to be those cochains which are multiplicative under fusion. So you have to think for a second about whether you can make fusion work uh, locally, since I'm, I'm using open covers, but you can. There's a, a fusion operation um, passes to, you can sort of lift it to the open covers, so this makes sense. So I'm going to look at um, cochains which are fusion, and this is a subcomplex. So that's the first step. Second step is I want to further pass to a subcomplex which is multiplicative under the figure of eight product, but, but not quite on the nose. 
I'm going to let C check LF for loop fusion, because we couldn't come up with a better name than that. So this is going to be a subcomplex of the fusion cochains. So, so those are going to be the fusion cochains such that with respect to this figure of eight product, if I pull back by the two small projections and multiply, I get the pullback by the figure of eight projection, but not on the nose, up to a co-boundary, where H is an arbitrary co-boundary, so in CK minus one, um, and in the fusion complex. So up to a fusion co-boundary, these are multiplicative under the fusion. Is it obvious that it's not empty? Uh, is it obvious, it obvious that, it's, that, it's, not that, it's, that it's not empty? Um, Maybe it's not obvious that it's non-empty, but I guess it will be once I state the theorem. <laughs> um, so again, I claim that both of these are subcomplexes, and so then I'm going to define loop fusion cohomology, loop fusion check cohomology of my manifold to be the kth cohomology group of the loop fusion complex with the check differential. And then the theorem from last year says that there is a transgression, sort of a loop fusion transgression map, which is an isomorphism from ordinary, well, so from check cohomology with this open cover downstairs, which is just ordinary cohomology, to this loop fusion cohomology group in degree k minus 1. And then, you know, there's a, there's a natural map from this thing into ordinary check cohomology where I just forget the loop fusion and fusion conditions. And then this composed map is exactly the transgression. So, ordinate, so cohomological transgression factors as an isomorphism through this loop fusion check cohomology group. Um, so that's sort of a, a nice then starting place for uh, your geometric objects. If you can break down your geometric object into a nice check cohomological description, then the geometric objects that you want to look for on the loop space are sort of those which are multiplicative under these sort of two conditions. And if you have stronger conditions, for instance, like thin homotopy or diffeomorphism equivariance, then you can actually relate, you know, for instance, if you have, let's say, functions which are in invariant under reparameterizations of the loop uh, in a strong sense, then you can relate the figure of eight product to the fusion product. You can kind of see like a, a little you know, zero length path in here, and then by reparameterizing, sort of turn it into the diffusion product. But if you don't have reparameterization invariant, these are, these are distinct products. But it sort of identifies these two products as the kind of minimal structure that you need to characterize transgression. How much time do I have? I can't quite see the clock there. Wow, that's so much time. All right, so now I want to describe a little bit. So I can describe these maps actually pretty explicitly, and it's just kind of a fun little exercise um, in sort of chasing around this quite nice diagram. So here's, here's the sort of the big picture here. So down in this bottom row, I'm going to draw a big diagram. I'm going to start with my space M, and then I want to look at su successive products of M. So I have M squared m cubed, m to the fourth, and so on, right? And so this is just two copies of m. It comes with two projection maps down to m. m3 comes with three projection maps to m squared, four projection maps here, and so forth. And so this thing going off to the right 
just taking all copies of M and projection maps back, this forms a simplicial space. It's okay, if you don't know what that is, it doesn't matter that much. But if you know what it is, then these projections just form naturally the face maps of a simplicial space, and then there's also degeneracy maps. And in fact, it's like a really sort of pretty trivial simplicial space. In fact, in the sense that if you take its geometric realization, I think it's just completely contractible. So it's a not that interesting simplicial space. Right, then starting over um, M2, I have the path space. Right, so if I want to work with three paths um, and not choose a base point, then I need to deal with the fact that this is a fibration over M2 and not over M. Okay, fine. So then in the upward direction, um, I have the path space, then next I have the fiber product of the path space with itself, and that comes with its two projection maps to IM. Then I have I3M with its three projection maps to I2M, and so forth. And if I look upward here, well not at M squared, but if I start at the path space and look upward, this is also a simplicial space. So from here up, this is simplicial space, and it's a non-trivial simplicial space. And as always, I want to identify this with the loop space. And here, since I'm using continuous loops, there are no technical problems with identifying, with just joining paths up. Okay, and what's the sort of rest of the diagram here? Well, over this, I don't know exactly what notation I want to use for this. Over here, what I want to look at are sort of paths over M with a marked point in the middle. So, right, so sort of a path that, a path where I remember its midpoint. And so that, you know, comes with three projections to M where I just project onto the beginning, middle, and end points. Um, and then over M4, there's sort of two marked paths with two marked points and so forth. And then I have, I have, let's see, I guess I have three maps back, back this way. So if I have a, a path with a marked point, there's three obvious paths here. I can just look at the first half, I can look at the second half, or I can take the whole path. Likewise, I'm going to have four maps this way, and so on. You can imagine what goes in that direction. Now, so one issue, though, is that this thing is not a simplicial space. Um, so, you know, if I, if I compose two projections, so one of the pieces of data for a simplicial space is if I look at, if I compose two projections, I'm supposed to be able to relate those to two different projections composed in a different order. Um, and this doesn't satisfy that, especially, essentially because, you know, if I have something with, with let's say, like, three pieces, and I project that onto something with two pieces in different ways, I get not quite the same path, but the same path up to reparameterization. So this is not a simplicial space on the nose, it's sort of only simplicial up to homotopy. And I think that's really kind of morally the underlying reason why I can't take this um, figure of eight prop, this figure of eight multiplicativity on the nose, I have to look at it sort of up to a co-boundary. It's related to the fact that this is not simplicial on the nose, but sort of weakly, sort of only up to homotopy. Right, but then if I go upward and I look at, so what's the fiber product of a configuration like this with itself over M3? Well, that's exactly my, my figure eight loop space, right? I have two configurations like this, and they have to match up at the points. So sitting over this, I have my figure eight loop space, which is really the fiber product of this thing with itself. Over this, I didn't define this, but you know, it's sort of the figure of whatever, oh boy, figure of that thing, loop space, oh, loops that sort of look like that. Um, and then again, right, so I said there's three maps this way, four maps this way. And so now you can imagine how to fill in the rest of the diagram. Okay, so I've got, and then if I take, let's say, functions on these spaces, um, then, you know, valued in a group, then I can associate differentials to these things, right? Because if I have, let's say, a function on here, valued in u1, well, I can pull it back in two different ways to m squared, take the alternating product. 
And I can pull it back in three ways to m cubed and take the alternating product. And that gives me a differential. And for these things which are simplicial on the nose, those differentials actually give me chain complexes. D squared is zero for those things. Um, but since this is not simplicial, this kind of D um, is not going to be zero on the nose. OK, great. So I have this sort of double complex of spaces. And really, you should think that there's a third axis here, um, which is the, the check covering. Right? So over this, I have a cover by open sets, which I can actually think about, if I like, as um, a space over M. I just take the disjoint union of all the open sets. Um, so I can think about, so let me, uh, at the risk of making this totally, well, OK. So I can think about my cover as a space over M, where I just take the disjoint union of my open sets. And then if I take the fiber product of that thing with itself, well, that's just exactly my you know, twofold intersections. And if I take the triple fiber product, that's the threefold intersections and so forth. So that's all of my check spaces. So I use a parentheses. Um, so this is a bracket product. This is a parentheses product. Um, so there's two maps that way and so forth. And I have associated covering spaces to all of the things on this diagram. And so there's sort of this third axis where there's these simplicial spaces coming out this way, and the differential associated in this third direction is exactly the check differential. So that's where all of this is living. So now let me describe the transgression map. And if I have time, the map that goes in the opposite direction. So I start with, let's see if I can make this match up with the diagram. Let me drop the Z. I'll just call this CK of M. So I start with a cochain in here, so a representative of my check cohomology class. I'm going to pull that back to what I call del A, which is just pi 1 star alpha inverse pi 2 star alpha. So that's just the differential associated um, with this simplicial space. So I just go from here to here. Then I pull it up by evaluation, by, you know, by the, this, this vibration map, which I didn't give a name. Let me give it a name. Let's call it epsilon. So then at this point, I have something that's a, um, a k cochain on the path space. Well, since I took, well, okay, so then this has the property that, well, okay, this is going to be a check co-boundary. So why is that? Well, the path space, you'd like to say it's contractible, which is not true because it's the free, spa, free path space. But it, it, it is retractable. It homotopy retracts onto the constant paths, which are just a, const, uh, you know, a single copy of M. And since I took the alternating product at the endpoints, this uh, check class has the property that it's trivial on constant loops. I mean, on constant paths. That's sort of obvious, right? If I have a constant path, then I'm just multiplying the same thing with its inverse. So it's trivial on constant paths. Well, the subcomplex of cochains, which are trivial on the constant paths, is acyclic. So um, since it's closed, it's exact. So it's a, it's a co-boundary beta for some beta in C k minus 1 I am. OK. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to make it. Um, right, so then I send beta. Oh, shoot. Then I send beta up here by pulling it back in two different ways to i squared m. So I send this to, at the risk of, I guess I've called all my things pi, which is bad form. So I look at pi 1 beta inverse pi 2 beta, and I call that eta, which is in C k minus 1 of the loop space. And then you can check that not only is it in here, it's actually a loop fusion class. So that's my representative element in uh, this enhanced check cohomology of the loop space. So that's it. And then you check that this doesn't depend on choices, and it doesn't. Um, so what about the map back? That's a little bit more complicated. So 
to describe the inverse map, um, let me just give a sketch. So I'm going to start with my k minus 1 class on the loop space. Well, so as not to overburden you with notation, let's just pretend that this is a global function for a second. So what I'm going to look at is the trivial bundle, the trivial z bundle over path space. So this, because it satisfies the fusion condition, the fusion condition um, lets me define an equivalence class on this trivial um, on this trivial bundle. So if I have gamma one, or so gamma a. I'm going to say that's equivalent to gamma prime a prime if a prime is equal to this, we're pretending it's just a fusion function, um, this fusion function evaluated on the loop obtained by gamma joined gamma prime purpose. So that's an equivalence relation on um, you know, paths that have the same endpoints. Uh, and, well, the fact that it's a fusion condition says that this is actually an equivalence relation um, on right, paths that have the same endpoints. So this whole thing actually descends down to a, a bundle. What am I calling it? Let's call it P over M squared, a Z bundle, P over M squared. So. The fancy word is this gives me descent data. The fusion condition is exactly the condition I need for this to give me descent data for this bundle to descend to a bundle over m squared. And while this was trivial, this is a non-trivial bundle. OK. Well, it's not really a bundle over m squared. It's really a local bundle. It's a bunch of bundles over k fold intersections on my cover over m squared. So really. It's a P, let me call it K, over U. This is where the notation gets a little overburdened. So I have my open cover of U. If I take products of those things, I get a good cover of M squared. And then if I look at, so K denotes the K fold intersections of these things. So I have this bundle um, locally by descent. And what's more, the fact that this is closed in the check sense says that if I, if I pass to k plus one fold intersections, if I pass to k plus one fold intersections, then I can form the sort of alternating, no, oh, Tensor product. Uh, oh boy, everything's called pi, isn't it? <laughs> Let's call them i since they're really inclusion maps. Um, so inclusion map j, let's say, of p k to the minus one to the j. So I take the alternating tensor product of these things by the inclusion maps, and this is over k plus one fold intersections. I don't know how many maps do I have? I guess j equals zero to k plus one, probably something like that. Um, so I'll define this bundle. This, because this thing is closed, this is a, a check co-cycle, this is canonically trivial. OK, so that means that then I can just take sections here and I can do that because this is a good cover. All these things are contractible. I mean, it's a big disjoint union of things which are contractible. So I can take local sections let's call it a section s of uh, just k given a section here I can now then pull those sections back to this trivial bundle and compare that. So that when I pull them back to this canonically trivial bundle, these sections just become a U1 function. So delta S just becomes a K minus 1 class 
on m squared. A check k minus one class on m squared. When you say canonically, do you mean that there's just kind of one obvious one sitting there, or do you mean like it's naturally isomorphic to a trivial? I mean, it is a trivial bundle, and there is a trivialization that you and I can always both agree on. So there comes with a canonical trivialization. Right. It's not, it's not a categorical statement on natural isomorphisms. A lot of people, when they say canonically, right. they always mean it's, there's some natural isomorphism going on. No, I mean that there is, yeah. there is a preferred trivialization, yeah. a preferred section yeah. of this thing, if you like. Right, so if I take sections of this and I sort of pull them back to this trivial bundle, that becomes a cycle. So that's now a, a co-cycle on m squared. Now I just need to get back to a co-cycle on m. Well, it turns out that, whew, right, that the... The complex associated to this simplicial space, because this simplicial space is trivial, this complex is exact. So if I, if I have an element in here um, and I take its differential this way, so if I look at now, so I should give this thing a name. Let's call this, what am I call this? I don't know, omega. So now if I look at delta omega, which is n c k m3, right, so I just take its alternating product pulled back to M3, well, the figure of eight condition now kicks in and says that this is trivial. Because Z, zero, since I'm using Z coefficients. So this is trivial here, and then this complex is exact. So that means that this actually comes from a class on M. Um, so I don't, okay, so. So that implies that omega is actually d alpha for alpha, a check uh, k, k. This is, this is k, where did I start? I started with k minus one, which confusingly is on k-fold overlaps because that's how check cohomology works. Then I went to something over k plus one, which is a check k chain. So I now have a check k chain on m. So that's my map back. And then it's actually you know, straightforward to check that these are inverses. And they're almost inverses at the chain level, not just in cohomology. Right? In each direction, there's a particular choice I have to make. In the transgression direction, I have to make a choice of co-boundary for the element here. And in this direction, I have to take a choice of section here. But it turns out that you know, given the choice that I made going in the transgression direction, that choice actually tells me a particular choice to make going in the reverse direction so that I get um, this map back on the nose at the level of chains. Um, right, and then you can prove that this map in the other direction doesn't depend on choices and that it coincides, once you forget this um, extra stuff, that it coincides with the ordinary transgression map in cohomology. So that's basically the proof, and it's just a fun little exercise in simplicial machinery. <laughs> Um, no analysis and only a 10 page paper, so it was just a joy to write. Um, so what would I like to do with this next? Well, so it was convenient to work with continuous loops and then I can take this big open cover and I don't really have to worry about anything. Well, of course I'd really like to deal with smooth loops. Um, and I think you can do that. You just have to be a little bit more careful with the cover. What sort of, um, what I need to m impose is that the, for instance, if I look at the paths, which index um, my open cover of path space. I want that collection of paths to be closed under join. Um, so you need to deal with those kind of technical issues. But I think that could be done. Um, then next, what would be really interesting to do is do this not just for check cohomology, but really for Deline cohomology. So then I'd really be looking at not just like bundles, say, or gerbs, but like bundles with connection or gerbs with connection. Um, and that, you know, would be more interesting and then would sort of give you a nice realization of a kind of higher um, transgression, higher holonomy for, for higher gerbs with connection, which would be of interest in, in various uh, parts of geometry. So thanks, I'll end there. Well, thanks. Are there questions, comments, complaints? No, oh. it's just a good question. <laughs> The, the important part of the machine is the, the, the choice of the problems, right? In the, the, the space. So sure, yeah. I was wondering if there is any sense 
that you know it's important to look uh, more in general at these problems. So, Please, bye. Uh, That's right. Yeah, well, it's a good question. And I mean, you know, so as I said, one of the things that gets confusing about this is that there's a lot of different ways to sort of compose loops, um, especially once you're allowed to do homotopy. You can sort of turn all these different products into each other. So, you know, it was sort of only after um, working with these things at a much more geometric level and really wrestling with more analytical details that it became sort of clearer and clearer that it was this this figure of eight product, which is associated to the join, um, that was what was really necessary. And that's also, you, you see that more clearly if you work with free paths. So what a lot of people will do is, you know, when they're going back the other direction uh, on the loop spaces, they just, well, we'll just choose uh, a base point in M, and then, you know, you have base paths, and then you sort of don't see that it's triviality in the complex in this direction that you want to sort of make use of. Um, but, you know, as for why else to justify these particular product structures on loop space, well, actually, something that was pointed out to me that's, you know, intriguing is that if you just draw these two pictures, this and this, and you just stare at those pictures, one thing that this is, where you also draw these pictures, is in a two category. These are the two ways to compose morphisms in a two category, right? So in a, in a category, I have objects which are dots and arrows, and then I also have morphisms between the morphisms, so sort of two, two morphisms. And there's two possible ways to, comp to compose morphisms. If I have mor a two morphism between these two and a two morphism between these two, I get a two morphism between these two. And likewise, if I have a two morphism between these two and a two morphism between these two, I have a two morphism between the composed morphism. So that probably means something. That's probably part of what's going on, although I don't have really anything deeper to say about that other than this, this kind of notational um, idea. What are gerbs? Yes, well, you know, the simplest answer is to just say that gerbs are to H3 as line bundles are to H2. Um, and, you know, there's various different flavors. If you're Berlinski, they are, mm, what are they? sheaves of groupoids. Um, if you're Murray, they're, um, I take a big fiber space over M, uh, and then I look at, uh, is that right? And then I look at the fiber product with it, and then I have a line bundle, oh, but, but I shouldn't have called this L. I'll have a line, so it's sort of fiber spaces and then line bundles which live over the fiber products of those um, spaces with themselves. And you can relate this to the, the groupoid picture. Um, these fiber spaces end up having to be infinite dimensional for these things to be non-trivial. Um, and so, you know, the theory gets a little bit complicated. But, you know, in, in a sense, they're all just different ways of constructing some kind of geometric object as classified by H3. Are there other questions? I have one, but I'll wait for others. So I had one. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you said that Wal Waldorf, 1F, in, at least in your answer. Waldorf, OK, yes. <laughs> um, Waldorf proved that U1 gerbs on M correspond to bundles on the loop space of M, which are fusion and thin homotopy equivariant. Yes, yeah. And you and Melrose proved that they correspond to bundles on L of M, which are fusion, diff plus of S1, and, and have strong smoothness? Yeah. That's, I mean, that seems weird to me. Then, then homotopy is being replaced by differentiable conditions, strong smoothness and diff plus. Is it obvious why that should? No, it's happen? definitely and not homotopy obvious. Homotopy is very topological. It has nothing to do with. That's right. Smoothness. And I didn't tell you what. Um, I didn't tell you what this very strong smoothness condition is. Well. But, but assuming it has to do with smoothness. And this has to do with smoothness, and it's very strong, and it actually interacts very nicely with um, diffeomorphism equivariance. So diffeomorphism, you know, are sort of, you know, smoothly invertible reparameterizations of loops. Um, and thin homotopy, well, maybe I don't want to go all the way to thin homotopy, but maybe I want to consider non-invertible smooth reparameterizations of loops, or maybe I want to go and I want to slow down, I want to stop for a little while, and then I want to you know, keep going. So I can reparameterize my loop. So whereas, so diffeomorphism, let's say if I 
write the loop as a map from 0 to 1, and then I identify the um, endpoints. A diffeomorphism is going to be a smooth, strictly increasing map. Maybe I want to look at smooth, um, monotone, but not strictly increasing maps. So those um, are you know, not invertible, obviously. But it turns out that if you have um, this sort of strong smoothness condition, if you're diffeomorphism equivariant and this strong smoothness condition means that you're also sort of equivariant with respect to these things. And that's getting a lot closer to smooth homotopy, which if you ignore the bit about sending out little tendrils, says that you can sort of do this as well as, you know, looping back on yourself. I have trouble with the smoothness, con smoothness conditions implying thin homotopy equivariance. I mm -hmm. have problems with the thin homotopy equivariance well, no, so going the other way. It's, well, the way you should read it is not that thin homotopy things are actually smooth, just that in the equivalence class of thin homotopy fusion things, there are smooth representatives. That's really sort of what it says. That, you know, there, in these classes, there are actually these very nice smooth representatives. Because all of these things are sort of up to some natural notion of equivalence, which right. again, I lied to you and I didn't tell you. It's it true that smooth, continuously homotopic paths inside a smooth manifold are smoothly homotopic. Right? That's true, yeah, yeah right. That's true. Right. Oh, and so it's kind of like, yeah, okay. It's kind of like that, yeah. It's like I can find, and I, I, yeah. But you should read it sort of like, like you would Hodge theory, for instance, right, which says that among, you know, Durham representatives for cohomology, I have, like, really nice smooth representatives which are harmonic. So it's something in that flavor, I would say. Right. Got it. Any other questions? All right, well, let's thank Chris again.